All right. So I mentioned um, that we plan on doing deep dives into each of the four recovery with equity strategies that our region has chose. Um, Andrew and I met and decided that the one we would go through first is support college preparation and early credit. And the reason why that was decided is because every county network chose that as one. So if you remember correctly in your year one work plans, you only had to choose two, um, but um, and many of you choose, chose all four, but you had to at least two, choose two and every county network chose support college preparation and early credit. So we thought we would start with that. Um, you know, uh, I know many of us, myself included, can automatically think I know what that means. So you read a bullet and go support college preparation early credit um, with an equity lens. I know what that means. I'm a county network. I'm running with things, right? Uh, but I think we really need to look at what the state says it means in that report. And some of you, raise your hand if you've read the Recovery with Equity 2021 report and can can all teach us, oh, Marie, stop it. Amy, okay, that's fair. Uh, and can thoroughly uh, spit out what the state's group said that they wanted um, wanted it to be. So that's it, it's yes, just for us. <laughs> to, just to be fair, Jamie, you said who read it and then you tacked on all the other stuff. Yeah, other things, <laughs> all right. Who read it first and then who can actually uh, regurgitate it and say what it means and has memorized it. Um, probably not many of us um, could meet those those check marks. So it's really to give us these deep dives on the same page of what that report says the state is looking at. So um, with the K-16 grant, I think the state, I know the state has a few main goals, right? One of them is developing and streamlining um, pathways in our region. Our region chose healthcare and um, education pathways. The other is fostering sustained, spontaneous uh, cross-sector collaboration with in our region, and our region is now growing to that surf region, our 10 county um, region, which, you know, I think we're really, really good at that. And then the third is to um, implement equitable student success strategies based on this 2021 recovery with equity report. The fourth is using the California career, cradle to career data system. So they, and they mean, and we'll go through that at, at another time uh, later today, but they mean CCGI for sure. So that's what the state is looking at. So they pass legislation in order for the regions to implement what they wanted to have implemented from a, a state perspective. So um, I'm with that, I'm gonna kick it off. Um, we've hired, you've noticed some new faces here or old faces that are in new roles. Um, so we have congratulations to uh, Bethany Davis, who is our program coordinator, um, handling a myriad of, of topics, but one of them, which is the early childhood space, um, which she's going to talk about in a little bit, but also talking about UC Davis and, as you know, NCSU Chico and being our strong partner and liaison with, with those two universities. And then we also have Andrew Fitzhugh is a new program coordinator. He's been with the Alliance Project and another student success area, so you may already know him. Um, but he is really going to be focused on recovery with equity strategies with us, um, as well as handling and um, a lot of our financial stuff. So he's got amazing cross sector skills. But today, he is lined up a deep dive where we're going to go over support college preparation and early credit with what's in that report. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Andrew and I am gonna be quiet most of the day. <laughs> this is great. All right, well, thank you so much, Jamie. Um, so like Jamie mentioned, uh, this is the most common um, chosen recovery with equity strategy between all of our counties. Uh, so this is the one we really wanted to start on first, um, just because it was so inclusive with everybody's pathway. So as we get started, I wanted to really highlight um, the important documents when it comes to uh, recovery with equity, one being the recovery with equity um, report that came out in February of 21, uh, which is the one we just spoke about that a lot of us read it, but can't exactly teach it um, to our counties just quite yet, which is why we're here today. Um, the second document um, is going to be the uh, clarification, oh, didn't mean to click on it is the clarification uh, on pathway and recovery with equity implementation. Um, 
And this one was sent out, I believe, in April of this year. Finally got some clarification, which is another reason we're doing these deep dives. Um, and it is on the bottom of the back side of that page. So if you guys ever go look at it, um, it's at the bottom there. We're specifically talking about uh, our recovery with equity. And we will be putting these in the shared county file. Um, so don't worry about if you want to look at it now. Um, we will be getting it all out to you guys. If you guys already don't have it already. <laughs> so first, I just wanted to also do a quick overview. So these are our four recovery with equity strategies um, that North State together and all of our counties um, uh, targeted to try and put into our pathways. So support college preparation and early credit, retain students through inclusive supports, implement high tech, high touch advising, and cultivate inclusive, engaging, and equity-oriented learning environments. Um, and today, we're going to be really focusing and deep diving on the support, college preparation, and early credit. And just a very quick overview of this specific recovery with equity strategy is its guiding principle is that facilitating student transition. Um, so getting in from high school um, to the four-year level, whether that's community college um, or straight to a four-year institution, as smoothly as possible and as prepared as possible. Um, they do highlight a few problems specifically with this guiding uh, principle, um, and that's inadequate college preparation. Um, next is limited advising and access to college information. And lastly is uh, constrained access to early college experiences. So with this guiding principle and this recovery with equity strategy, the goal is to have a robust strategy for academic preparation, proactive support, and advising to meet academic and career goals. And I know it's the very first week of some of you that have children, it's the first week of summer. So I really wanted to kind of get us going and get us talking and get the blood flowing a little bit. Um, so we want to do a little breakout group right here. Um, and I believe Jamie's going to help us break out into those. But really quick, here's the scenario. So we have a motivated high school sophomore that reveals to their high school counselor their goal to become the first generation college graduate. They inquire on what is the quickest and most efficient way of earning their post-secondary degree. So as we break out, I'd want us to discuss these three questions. One, is there a default curriculum plan for this student in your county? And two, what barriers are in, this, are in the way for this student obtaining their degree? And three, how could this scenario have been addressed prior to the student entering high school? So, and we will be copying and pasting these into the chat that way, it, that way you don't have to try and remember all three of these or the scenario. Um, so Jamie, if we could break everybody out into their groups. All right. Are you gonna have like We came back. So first, and all of these questions were very specifically worded and tried to get you guys talking about these specific pieces. And I know in, in my breakout group specifically, we hit on so many of these, which is what I was really hoping for, um, that you guys are already on the right thought process. Um, now it's just getting it on the same wavelength as what the state is kind of looking for. Um, so one was A through um, G coursework as a default high school curriculum. Um, so making sure that it's the same um, at each high school in and throughout the county, that way each, you know, each student has the same opportunity. Um, and as of right now, um, we shared that that is one of the barriers as well. Um, and then also, as kind of Veronica spoke to, is alternative programs for those students um, that opt out of the CP. Is there, is there non-credit to kind of figure out ways to kind of streamline this most efficient, not spending time on a, on a major that we eventually will change and things like that. Um, and I specifically wanted to um, bring up the link here to where you can specifically look at schools in your county and see what A through G courses they do offer, which ones are honors um, and which ones, which ones are offered and what's classroom based. Um, so here I just, and I can go back to the main page. So it just, 
A through G course list. Um, I'm an enterprise graduate, so I just quickly pulled it up. A little bias in that way. Go Hornets. Yeah. But I wanted to see what is available. Um, and this is all readily in the public, so students can look this up. Parents can look this up. Counselors, obviously, should be knowledgeable of this, be able to advise their students um, in an accurate and efficient way. Um, so you can see here what's exactly offered um, and what's not offered at each one of these uh, respective schools. So um, you can see enterprise here does have quite a few offered and classroom based, but this isn't true for every single school um, in our 10 county um, North state region. Um, there's, you have to come up with different ways. Um, you know, if you look up little more rural high schools, you will see that these are online based, hybrid based and different um, ways to piece this together for the students. So this is a really good resource to figure out if the schools in your county are on the same page, if you guys do have a um, default high school curriculum um, leading into um, the CSUs and UCs, and this leading into just the most efficient way um, that a student can kind of get into um, their pathways. Sharing. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, shared with the state that these are, you know, contributes um, and leads right into the next kind of bullet point here is having that default um, curriculum really contributes to the successful transition to our post-secondary. So I'm going to quit. All right. And the last little piece that the state is is loving for the default curriculum is, is making sure we do have those early college credit opportunities. So using the college and career access pathways. Um, such as dual enrollment to get the early credits um, to where they could possibly graduate, um, you know, a semester or a year early, which, you know, gets them through more efficiently and financially saves everybody money. Um, so, which is always a motivator. Um, and then I, we found this piece, um, and this is just showing the misalignment between A to G coursework. Um, and graduation requirements. And we just found this piece, this one specifically Shasta Union High School District. Um, and you can see there's on the top for their graduation requirements. And then the A through G requirements um, below. Um, they do have more added in here than what is required in A to G, but you can see the differences and how they could be misaligned. One with Shasta Union High School District and other high, um, high school districts in the area. And Jamie, did you have something? Oh, I was just going to uh, point out, like, on this one, foreign language is an A to G requirement, but, you know, is not a requirement to graduate. And then conversely, um, uh, four years of social science is required to graduate high school at Shasta Union High School District, but only two years is required from A to G. So um, just looking at your graduation requirements versus A to G requirements. So the second question that we all spoke about was, um, you know, what barriers are in the student's way to obtaining their degree? And a lot of us touched on is, is the limiting advising. Um, the state recognizes that scheduling is a very, you know, tough subject when it comes to uh, meeting with these kids is, you know, uh, I believe it's the national average of it, like counselors to students is 430 to one while California is at 612 to one. So it's showing that one you know, counselor is having to cover so many students that they might not have the time um, to meet with every single student or give them the full, you know, they might be only able to eat or meet for half an hour. Um, so the state definitely recognizes that this is a huge barrier as well as having access to that staffing. Do they have enough um, geographical location? Do they have to travel? Um, do they have lack of, um, you know, internet connectivity to where they can't zoom to where this is a huge barrier for a lot of these, um, a lot of these rural communities and it, the state is absolutely recognizing this and is recommending that this is, is something that we need to touch on. Um, so staffing, geographical location, misconceptions, one that they highlighted was college prep is too difficult. And a lot of the times this is molded in and that last lab, it last uh, bullet point is the lack of preparation at elementary and middle school can affect that placement. Do you get into that CP class? Is it intimidating because of the 
just the perception of it that's given off by a teacher, an advisor early on at the middle school levels. Um, it sounds like Siskiyou uh, County is, is already doing a very good job at the CTE advisors at the middle school level to really control these misconceptions to where it does seem attainable and it's not as daunting. It doesn't seem scary. Um, and that's a huge piece is that we're showing that it, it's, it's capable, it's doable and for everybody. Um, you just need the assistance along the way and the correct advising which gets into their last piece is having robust professional development. So this is reaching the student before they get to the high school and have this conversation as a sophomore is, do we have professional development for K through 16 faculty, admin and staff for all of them to have this information, to talk to them in their second, third grade classes and, and all the way through um, and using this data piece. Is, is showing them um, and using it and making sure that we're all on the same page and reporting the same, that way there isn't any other misconceptions as well. And then the last piece is advising. Um, for me, and you guys touch on it a lot, it's the holistic approach when it comes to advising is listening to the student and figuring out what is specifically gonna be successful for that student, I think is, is huge in these rural communities. I know for me, and when I was in high school, I struggled at English pretty mightily, but the way that my counselor phrased, um, I took a concurrent enrollment class with Shasta College to where I had only had to do one quick summer semester. It took care of my senior year English, and I took care of English 1A once I got to um, Shasta College. So for me, that motivated me quickly because then I'm done with English and I'm ahead, um, all because of my counselor had all of that information readily and um, gave me some amazing um, advising when it came to my education um, pathway and career um, and course scheduling. And they really touched on the state did in the report on K through 12 accountability is touching on that it isn't just the high or the, the four years that they're expecting prepared students to come to them. It's all the way through K through 16. It's not just the high school that needs to start preparing all of this as well. It's that everybody kind of needs to be accountable. Um, kindergarten all the way through 12. It's not any specific, you know, grade level that's going to be determining this. It's, it's all the way through. And that last piece, which we all love is, is creating these teams of everybody at all of those levels, that way that you have all of the information and figuring out and um, dismantling all of those barriers. Sure. Yeah. And again, using Enterprise High School is the college and career indicator. Um, to emphasize that college and career is something that is like an emphasis to be reported on. And this is coming down from the Education Commission of the States. And so if it's something that they're going to be paying attention to, then it should be the state's Department of Education to also make an emphasis on the college and career readiness uh, into their district and high school report cards. So basically showing if they're gonna emphasize this on a close to a federal level, then we should really start focusing on this on, on a state level as well. And if it's going to be reported, let's have an emphasis. And then, James, I believe I was going to stay sharing this, this piece as we were going to touch on the college and career indicator um, on the North State Together side. Yeah, so um, early on uh, last year when we were um, getting ready to apply for the K-16 grant, um, I worked, I talked with Marie and a few others about this, and, and I threw together this little dashboard that shows our region's just overall CCI um, preparedness um, indicators. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic and other things, the latest data, comprehensive data anyway, is from 2019. Um, I just downloaded this morning some 2020, 2021, and 2022 files. Um, around CCI from the state, but unfortunately they're not comprehensive. So it's the, as you can see from the earlier, the page that um, Andrew showed about Enterprise High School, it wasn't, it's not required to report it. So it's not complete. 
Um, I am going to play with those files and see if maybe I can update this to some latest information, but um, I was really disappointed in how incomplete it was compared to what I got in 2019. But this is on our website for our regional area, um, and this does include the 10 counties. Um, I think it's one of the few that I did before the grant that actually has the 10 counties in it. So. Thank you, James. And then just a quote to kind of, for me, tied it all together. Um, and it really kind of hit home for me uh, specifically in the report was um, this one from Mikkel Kulander of UC Davis is to reduce inequality and in educational attainment, we must better align our systems of education reduce the information barriers and improve support for students navigating the road to a college degree. So for me, I think this hit home and it really kind of full circled our entire conversation today. We're now onto our deep dive number two. So this one is our retained students through inclusive supports. Um, just very quickly, just want to talk about the important documents again. I know everybody's got their textbook out. I don't know if my screen will pick it up. I got mine tabbed out with our four different strategies. You know, of course, each county doesn't have to do all four. Um, multiple did, you know, some focused on just two, um, which is all perfectly fine. Um, what I'm trying to do today is really just, you know, if you haven't taken a look at the fine detail print, um, hopefully this is just a way to make it a little bit more simplified and, you know, maybe click in your brain in a different way than just, you know, reading the, the formal text. So we do still have the two documents. So the recovery with equity uh, report from February 21, and then the clarification, which all of these are um, linked in our agendas as well as the county shared file. So um, if you have trouble finding it, um, either reach out or take a look at those places. Um, either way, we can get it to you. So just a summary of the four again. And today's the retained students through inclusive supports. All right, so an overview of this strategy. Um, this falls under the guiding principle of foster, inclus uh, foster inclusive institutions. Um, and the problem that they're trying to tackle here is that institutional cultures and classrooms are not shaped around the experience of students of color and adult students. And this impacts that student's success. Um, so their goal is to purposely assess and if needed, revamp existing support activities and develop new practices to promote student well-being and academic success. And we're going to dive a little bit more into each one of these. Okay, so the first kind of policy that they wanted to touch on is representation and belonging. So they want to take a look at expanding programs that promote students' representation and sense of belonging. Um, and this one really, I, I know it touches um, on my previous work. I used to run all of the student clubs at Shasta College. Um, so it's promoting those. You know, on campus, um, I know we have on at least just specifically talking Shasta College, um, they have Amoja, so supporting the African American community, um, which is also a program, but they've also used it as a club as well. Uh, there's others, um, just subject area, so art and history, if they're in, you know, uh, if they're all involved, getting them together and fostering, you know, like a community, um, the Gay Straight Alliance, uh, multicultural. Um, there's also hobbies so that, you know if everybody's interested in student government getting that started together um, chess anything to really just bring the community together um, and it could also be um, you know community so i know there's um, ffa that's a, um, in a lot of our rural counties um, so that's a, another you know club and then that can be also turned into like a club on um, at schools not just like a separate um, you know, entity. And then next is fostering collaboration and alignment between student and academic affairs. Um, so this is bringing individuals in direct that are going to be directly affected by the decisions. So they have an opportunity um, to have their say before decisions are made. Um, you know, this could be through um, student senate, 
Um, and I know I'm talking very specifically about community colleges, which is just how this report was focused. Um, there are many ways this can be tied into high schools. Um, so that's one way is having the students that might be affected having a word. You know, it they might not make the decisions themselves, but, it, you know, they need to be heard, you know. So if they're going to be directly affected by it, so their voice kind of needs to come from somewhere. And the last one is empowering faculty with student support information is so the faculty they have the most interaction, you know, on a day to day basis with these students. So having the faculty have like the knowledge of specific um, individual supports, um, you know, the basic need center, if it is on a campus, um, a food pantry, um, just as simple as academic counseling, um, mental health, um, you know, psychology help, anything um, that could promote a student's um, success. You know, it's very important that the teachers know all of this um, and can direct them in a way and can kind of sense um, some help without maybe a student directly telling them they need the help. So being very um, inclusive as like a whole community on campus, knowing where resources are and, you know, getting the student to those resources. All right. The next policy they wanted to touch on is the statewide approach for student access. So the policy is developing a statewide approach for California students to access certain supports, regardless of their campus and system affiliation. So this could be year round non traditional availability to better serve everybody, you know, that's in the working or caregiving obligations. Um, so year round can definitely mean having summer sessions uh, through June and July. So not just having a big break between May and August, um, making sure, you know, and most do have summer school. So um, a lot of it's already implemented, but can we build on those summer school sessions? So is there non-traditional uh, opportunities? So evening, weekend, um, hybrid, um, some self pace, you know, not everybody has the time of day to sit in a classroom and go along at the same steps as everybody. Um, so implementing um, these different resources that are non-traditional. Um, another option is having community campuses, um, having college centers. Um, we have our community leadership center now um, through Shasta College downtown. I encourage everybody to um, stop on by and, and check out the our fourth floor for North State Together, but all the other floors that uh, are really focused on the community. Um, it's a unbelievable building so please come on by it's specifically kind of for this use um, next is so collaboration and alignment among student support uh, departments so one that always kind of hits me is having the connection between like basic needs and the office of students with disabilities this is just one example but um, this is one that just it, it used to come to my desk all the time is students with disabilities they could have different you know lack of funds because they do have to allot some to transportation in different ways so having that department know that there's the basic needs connecting them warm handoffs so not just telling them that that office does this but hey you know jamie in the basic needs center um, I just called over. She's expecting you. These are some things. She's so heartwarming and everything. She's going to get you what you need. Um, you know, actually, I have the time right now. I'll walk you on over. So collaborating and really you know, adopting this uh, philosophy to really make sure that the student feels that they're supported and that you're there for them. Oh, sorry, I want to check in on the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything. Right. All right. So next is role of uh, policing in higher education, and it is policing, so not policing. So I really had to change my mindset in that, just the way I'm looking at it. So it's how does um, so how do you evaluate impact of institutional culture, particularly um, African American, Latinx, and Indigenous students? Um, so how is the campus safety affecting their um, 
their success? Uh, are they, do they have a sense of safety? Do they have a sense of fear? Um, you know, is it directed towards, um, whether intentional or not, was it directed towards a particular group? Um, and is it just um, systematic biases? So how they would like this to be practiced and implemented is empowering students to engage in the academic affairs and the DEI work that's at the school. So again, bringing in that student voice from these groups to see exactly how uh, campus safety, whether you know they just might be stepping into a classroom, but they might not know they're stepping into like a club meeting specifically for African American students. And now they just feel like they're kind of targeted and sitting in that room when it might just be random. But that gives off, a, you know, like a, a sense of maybe I'm being watched and we're doing something wrong when that can absolutely not be the case. So making sure that student voice is heard, you know, specifically with campus safety. Um, this can be done through, you know, surveys, um, and on the next side, we'll touch on a little bit, but uh, campus climate. So how is everybody being appreciated and supported? And, and it might not always be campus safety. So this last piece of adopting community-based approaches for addressing campus safety issues. Um, one instance that I can specifically think of is if there is um, something tragic that does happen on campus there isn't always those resources like for psychology help um i remember one of my uh, one of my friends in sixth grade it was it was accidental suicide but they did not have one counselor to support one entire sixth grade but a, a bunch of kids in junior high so they would bring in um a team of local um you know psychologists mental health counselors to be able to support every single student um, and you know that can't always come from campus safety in a way you know they are there to help protect and help in those situations but they're all not mental health counselors so in some of those situations bringing in the community you know it, it fosters the whole community you know it's not saying it's not putting all the burden on campus safety but just like having an open mind, how can we best support these students um, and how are they going to receive the information? Do they, again, have that sense of safety or do they have that sense of fear? And metrics for campus climate. So the policy is developing research-based metrics for evaluation uh, campus climate and its impact on student success and retention. Uh, so this is really the data piece, um, which we've all, a couple of us have expressed that we really love. Um, so it's like, how do we create these data pieces? How can we cre uh, create metrics to see where we're at, you know, and progress um, and how we're progressing? Um, so different ways to do the campus climate, um, for one, like sense of belonging. So student surveys you know, measure their students' feelings of belonging through different questions to get a sense of their community inclusion and connection specifically with the um, with the campus environment. Um, or fo another way is focus groups and interviews. Or if there's experiences with discrimination and harassment, taking a look at incident reports and getting the numbers off of that and just seeing and tracking and analyzing if there's any discrimination, if there's any biases on campus um, that might contribute to their sense of belonging. And there's, there's many other ways um, to take a look at all this data. There's so much out there. Um, we can also, incident reports, retention rates. This can very much give us information on how certain um, groups, um, you know, perceive the campus. Do they feel invited? You know, if they're not, they're most likely not going to go. So that some data can come from that. Um, some teachers can also do this in the classroom. Their partition patient rates, um, their, in, their involvement. Um, other little ways and each county, of course, is going to look completely different on how they want to approach this um, and you know please reach out I'm, I'm more than willing to take a look at everybody's um, situation and, and their goal and and kind of figure out how we can create some metrics for the campus climate. All right, thank you Jamie is everybody seeing the PowerPoint again. 
All right, perfect. Yep. All right, so deep dive uh, number three, we're going to be talking about implementing the high tech, high touch advising. And just uh, wanted to touch base on just another important document and they are um, in your shared folder. And if you can't have access to that, you know, please reach out. We want to get you all these documents so they're right in front of you. But I want to highlight the K-16 collaborative data metrics. Um, and we'll touch base on the metrics for this specific uh, strategy uh, on the last slide, but I highly suggest taking a look at it as it could help guide um, ways um, and uh, in your narratives and figuring out different ways to show progress towards these um, different strategies. Perfect. And just again, just a reminder of our four selected recovery with equity strategies. Now diving in. So the guiding principle is facilitating student transition. Uh, the problem they see in this is the inadequate college preparation, limited advising and access to college information uh, and constrained access to uh, early experiences or early college experiences, excuse me. And their goal is for learners to have access to high tech, high touch advising systems uh, that support them from middle school through high school and beyond all the way through 16. The first policy that they highlighted is to be able to create a statewide integrated platform uh, for these middle schools, high school and college learners um, to access all of this information. So for one is uh, CaliforniaColleges.edu. Um, I know we all have our um, opinions on the assessments, but there's still really good information for to track progress with the students, um, as well as on the advisor side, counselors, um, you know, county leads, anything that we can get. There's still really good data um, being able to track other progress other than the um, like career assessments. Um, so leveraging all of this data to be able to personalize um, the student support. Um, next is also designing the platform for learners and parents to track progress. So um, I know Doris touched on it a little bit, but they'll be able to see it all the way through and have access to uh, being able to apply to each um, college system that we currently have uh, in California. And then as well as making the chat bot available um, via texting platforms. Um, I, I'm spacing on the, the county that previously brought it up, but they had a Spanish speaking student actually receive a text in Spanish um, to where that prompted them to be like, get into the system. And as they felt really welcomed um, and inclusive, um, that the chat bot was very accessible to different languages. The next policy, they really liked the integrated advising tools. So that was the piece um, on the admin side of it to where you leverage all of the analytics and to be able to intervene um, when there might be some red flags, uh, if, if a student is off progress um, or does have like a career change um, in mind, um, there could be some triggers in the system to be able to reach out to the student um, without the student specifically reaching out. As we all know, it's sometimes hard to reach out for help that you might not know is there, but the advising team does. So to be able to um, have these integrative tools um, in the in the platform to help the student and help our uh, admin side of it and to be able to, to track some metrics and some data. And the third policy is getting some professionally trained advisors. So establishing a plan uh, to have uh, advisors middle school all the way through the uh, post-secondary, that way there's no one left behind. It's not like when someone has a middle school advisor, um, what happens when they when they move past middle school? They still need the help. They still um, need the assistance. There's still just more, you know, as we get older, there's still, you know, more uh, criteria and things to understand. Um, so being able to have professionally trained um, advisors at each level, but and then also having virtual one on one advising appointments available for the easier access. So it might not always mean a, a, a counselor on site. There might be someone contracted to be able to have virtual one on ones uh, for this advising um, through this platform.
And this is the piece that uh, I was talking to about the new important document is now the metrics. They have have some uh, required metrics from the K-16 Collaborative, as well as some additional metrics that you can dive even deeper into if, uh, if it's of interest. Um, so number of students advising, uh, utilizing the advising tool. So um, seeing, as we saw, how many students haven't even registered, how many have started and whatnot that Doris was showing. Uh, and I love that she came on first so we can able to see um, those types of uh, of data and visuals. Um, so percent of students registered and an average number of workshops that the student might attend. Um, and then the additional ones is getting further into like the financial piece. Has every single senior uh, or in 12th grade uh, completed their financial aid module or their FAFSA? And if they need assistance and being able to then track that data um, participating advising and then the career assessments and the helpfulness of the advising tools and the chat bot. So sending out the surveys, uh, students, parent, and I, as we spoke about, there's other entities that could uh, be involved and have their feedback um, and we'll um, address those in the appropriate avenues. I know this one uh, was relatively quick, but I think Doris actually did a very good job of seeing the direction and kind of presenting it to you guys. Um, and this uh, piece went right with it, with the high tech advising. And we will share out that slide that she shared about the different recovering with equity strategies that this specific tool touches, um, but I can quickly kind of review it as well. Um, but so the one of these lead that implement high tech and high touch advising. So providing the comprehensive uh, and customized sets of lessons, tools for the students and educators and just streamlining the entire process. The other is retain students through inclusive supports. This is uh, offering the tools and resources uh, six through 12. Um, and partnering with the school districts to further uh, support data monitoring and targeting uh, the student intervention and when we need to step in. And the third uh, that out of our four selected is the support uh, college preparation and early credit. And this is by that uh, California College's EDU uh, platform, uh, providing A through G coursework verification, as well as like L eligibility tracking for the CSU and uh, UC applications. This is deep dive number four of four. So you know, thank you for bearing with me here as we keep going through um, our selected recovery with equity strategies. Uh, the specific one today is to cultivate inclusive, engaging and equity oriented learning environments. And again, just want to touch on the important documents that really go with these recovery with equity strategies, um, along with the report. Um, so if you guys have any troubles accessing this, please reach out. I'd love um, to get you a copy. They are also in our shared folder. And just a very quick review as we get to our last one of the four selected recovery with equity strategies. And I do plan on taking each one of the videos that I've done of the deep dives and combining it into one um, video. That way you guys can take it to um, committees or wherever you guys are going or watch it yourself. You don't have to go and look for four separate ones and search through a whole meeting. Um, so I do plan on doing that and getting that out to everybody. Um, All right, the guiding principle, fostering inclusive institutions. And this is the same guiding principle as our deep dive number two, retain students through inclusive supports. And the problem uh, that we are trying to tackle is that institutional cultures and classrooms are not shaped around the experiences of our students of color and adults. And this impacts the overall success of these, uh, of these students. And the goal of this recovery with equity strategy uh, starts with the culturally competent learning environments, career relevant knowledge and skills, equity oriented uh, curricula, and course pathways to promote these inclusive uh, cultures. And I will be diving deep into these right now. So mandating upskill training, uh, the policy is speaking to um, enacting legislation, trying to get training to all of the, uh, whether that be board members, staff, faculty, admin, uh, 
to tackle some of these problems. So the practices that the state has um, has shown as examples of being successful uh, starts with the revamp and re-envision of the curriculum. And this is across uh, disciplines and to be able to be anti-racist and equity uh, centered and foster a sense of belonging for each one of these students. Um, this uh, can be done uh, for an example, uh, through student course evaluations. Um, I always love to tie the student's uh, voice in because you know they're the ones that are going through it. Um, so we always need to listen. So including um, course evaluations and including the question pertaining to whether that specific course content aligned with principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. A second practice um, mentioned was to implement culturally competent teaching and learning practices, uh, which includes routinely assessing the instruction um, from that diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, perspective. So taking a step back and regularly doing this, whether that is that course evaluation at the end of every course, or that whether that's um, you know evaluations with the specific uh, you know admin and staff, whatever uh, that may be, is just regularly going through and checking in and just making sure um, that we have our DEI uh, perspective covered. And lastly, the equity centered practice. Um, is just teaching, learning, grading, annual evaluations, faculty review, just a few more examples of that. Next is empowering and incentivize the faculty, staff, and administration. So getting in and giving them the power. So practicing the regularly um, going through and then establishing report channels. Um, if they see something that they feel is off, having a comfortability of going up the chain of command and just um, not to put blame, but to see where change can come from. Um, and again, each level doesn't know without the feedback and communication. Uh, so to create that culturally responsive and easily accessible channel um, is really making sure that we have the sense of belonging, not just for the student, but for the staff. Um, kind of interacting with one another. And the last one, partner with employers to meet the workforce needs and offer the work-based learning. So this is um, going outside of just the institution and making sure that we are aligning um, all of our work-based learning and our courses to be able to um, stay along with the anticipated statewide and regional workforce needs. And the last one, I think all of us hit this um, right on is incorporating the on and off ramps. So this is making sure that we're flexible for those adult learners um, and having alternative ed. Um, you know, we always push this um, it's just making sure that if someone for life reasons, whether they need to step out um, for work or they need to step out for caregiving of a family member, that they have a chance to attend to their life, but then have a step back in. So that, that's um, the on and off ramps. And including these adults and programs that focus on the the adults. So once again, the continuing education programs within the edu uh, within the institution and all of the system goals. And lastly, is to offer uh, competency-based courses and programs. Um, and this is to have it based on evidence of, of mastery and not seat time. So it's not just making sure that they're in the class and going through it um, in an entirety, but can they somehow earn credit by other skills that they have already mastered? Um, so again, the easy uh, the on ramp of experiences that they've already gone through in life um, and somehow getting them back into the education system. All right, and that is the last one. This one's this one was relatively short, um, as they've kind of already they kind of 
uh, tie in with our second deep dive of just really trying to include um, everybody, making sure everyone has their voice, making sure we have the um, inclusive and equity oriented learning environments. And if anybody have any questions, um, feel free.